<laughs> okay, my watch says three o'clock, so um, go ahead and get the meeting going. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to call the December 21st, 2020 Water Board meeting to order. Heather, could you please start with a roll call? Sure. Uh, Chair Williams? Here. Allison Here. Gould? Here. Kathy Peterson? Here. Scott Holwick? Here. Roger Lang? Here. Um, Ken Hewson? Here. Nelson Tipton? Here. Uh, Wes Lowry? Here. Kevin Bowden? Here. Um, Francie is not here yet. Jason is coming in. Um, Council Member Martin? Here. All right. Board will, or Chair Williams, you have a quorum. Great. Thank you, Heather. Uh -huh. um, the item three on the agenda is approval of the previous month's minutes, the October 19th, 2020. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments on the meeting minutes? I don't see any. If there's no comments, does someone want to make a motion for accepting the October 19, 2020 meeting minutes. Um, Kathy? Uh, Kathy Peterson here. I move that we accept the um, October 19, 2020 minutes as submitted. Okay. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Sounds like Allison is the second. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda, item four, is the water status report. Is that Nelson or Wes? Nelson? Yeah, I'll go ahead, Todd. Um, so the flow of the St. Brain Creek at Lyons at 8 a.m. today was 9 CFS. And the 124-year average, um, historic average, uh, for this date is 17 CFS. The call on the St. Brain Creek is Pleasant Valley Reservoir. And the admin number is 7822. And the priority date is 8-1-1871. Call on the main stem of the South Platte River is the uh, Riverside Canal. And the admin number is 21031. And the priority date is 8-1-1907. So Ralph Price Reservoir at Button Rock Preserve is currently uh, full in spilling. And um, Due to the scheduled outlet repairs, that's why it's still full for this time of year. And it's antici anticipated to be completed, the outlet repairs by March of 2021. And uh, Jason will go over that, I believe, in his um, update, project update. So Union Reservoir is currently at 21.3 feet. Uh, full is 28 feet. So it's down approximately 4,500 acre feet and uh, currently release in 10 CFS. And I'll just, this is gonna to touch base, I think, on more of the snowpack, but, but the current snowpack for the South Platte River Basin is 76% of normal. And then the upper Colorado snowpack is at 73% of normal. And that completes my report, Todd. Any questions? You're muted. Any questions? I'm sorry, are there any questions for Nelson? I'm not seeing anybody with their hand up. Okay, All right. go Thank ahead you. and move on. Um, the next item, item five, is public invited to be heard in special presentations. And talking to Heather before the meeting, it does not sound like we have any public invited to be heard. Um, Ken, is there any um, special presentations for today? Um, yes, we have. Uh, Sean Cronin and Jason Rodebush with the St. Vrain and Left Hand Water Conservancy District. I'll let uh, Kevin introduce the, the item and uh, then let Sean and Jason take over. Okay, go ahead guys. So uh, today we have uh, Sean and Jason here to discuss the, uh, the progress of the district's efforts on the uh, St. Brain Left-Hand Water Conservancy District Stream Management Plan. 
Um, for some of you, uh, this is an all, all new item. Um, but uh, the board last heard an update on this in July of 2017. So I will let Jason take it from here. Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, before uh, Sean and Jason kick off, I wanted to disclose for the record for transparency's sake that I'm general counsel for the Conservancy District. This is not an action item that we're um, entertaining here, so I'm not planning to recuse myself from participation, but just wanted people to, to know and uh, understand. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, so Heather, if you could just note that in the minutes and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Sean. I sure will, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna turn it over to Jason, our, our uh, newest employee, and then I'll, I'll pick up the back end. So uh, Jason, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, you bet. Uh, thank you all. My, my name is Jason Rodabush. I'm a water resource specialist with the St. Vrain and Left Hand Water Conservancy District. Uh, I've been with the district for about six months now, mm -hmm. and I'm pleased to report that the SMP for both St. Vrain and Left Hand Creeks was completed in October. Uh, this project was a phase one effort, uh, which took nearly three years to complete and was formally accepted by our board of directors uh, on October 12th. Next slide, please. So phase one of the stream management plan was made possible with the generous support from the city of Longmont. And we certainly wanna thank you for that. Um, this is a list of partners as I, and as you can see, um, you know, support really came from a, a wide range of, of public, private and, and nonprofit entities all with the common goal of improving our basin. And, and I think that is um, fairly unique to this area of Colorado. Uh, next slide. Uh, so why did the, the district take on a stream management plan and, and what is it exactly? Uh, to answer the what of that question is, is that this is really a process driven by the CWCB. Um, and, and it's to engage stakeholders and identify the current and, and future water needs uh, of the water users in the basin. And then through that stakeholder process and that stakeholder engagement, you know, come a lot of conversations, a lot of actions, and then um, some strategies for, for implementing the stream management plan and then eventual fundraising. Um, back to the question of why it's important um, you know, for our major partners like Longmont, I think it's important to understand how the CWCB builds the state's funding priorities through um, planning efforts. So um, if you remember way back, the, the, the first water planning efforts, the first that I can remember at least, you know, started with the basin implementation plan where uh, projects and processes were identified and prioritized for funding. And as a part of that basin implementation plan, the, the St. Vrain and Left Hand Stream Management Plan was one of those processes. And because it was uh, a major part of that stream management plan, it was eventually funded by the state. Um, and then if you know the basin implementation plan was up and rolling for a few years, and that eventually led to the Colorado Water Plan, which resulted in some legislation, the construction fund, um, and, and the result of that was bringing millions of dollars to the basin or to the state for water projects. And our basin has received some of that. Uh, as we keep progressing, uh, most recently we have the passing of some uh, new legislation, Proposition DD, which is um, uh, to collect proceeds from gambling. Uh, and that's ready to hit this summer and to fund big water projects. So really as, as we've worked through the progression uh, within our basin here. I, I believe that our timing is excellent with the completion of this plan. You know, our next step is to bring forward projects um, and, and other efforts to the state for, for funding. And, you know, we anticipate a lot of that funding to start hitting in July, uh, depending on, you know, the impacts to the state budget from COVID. But from what we're understanding, that, that money is going to start to be made available in July for projects. Uh, next slide, please. So this SMP was a big bite compared to some of the other plans in Colorado. And in total, we addressed an entire watershed at uh, about 500 square miles. And underneath that large umbrella, the, the stakeholders established desired conditions and management goals. Um, and what was different about our basin and this SMP is that in, in some of the smaller stream management plans, like the upper Colorado, it really focused on 
um, you know, single elements of the basin like trout, the cold water fishery in the upper Colorado. Now, because our basin is more of a working river than say the upper Colorado, we took a more holistic approach to tackling the stream management plan. So for example, uh, a desired condition for water management on the St. Vrain is, is, and I can quote here, uh, to achieve a balance amongst the needs of the natural environment, non-consumptive and consumptive users. So we, we really left the door wide open for uh, a number of different projects from ag to municipal to conservation and wildlife. And then underneath those desired conditions, the, the water management goal for um, say the infrastructure component at least, um, and I quote, uh, work with water rights holders to ensure the water supply needs are met and not interrupted. Uh, explore issues and concerns and find opportunities for mutually beneficial management improvements. So we, we've really taken into account all of the stakeholders in this basin and, and we want to move forward holistically with this approach. So stepping off from the established desired conditions and management goals, uh, our consultant completed a stream health evaluation um, and, and then utilized that to determine opportunity areas. And this is really uh, chapter five, the meat and potatoes of this report, and uh, I'd encourage you to get into it. Um, you know, that, that data was then used to come up with strategies for, for implementation. Next slide, please. So if you've had a chance to flip through the report, I'm not sure if you have, you'll notice that there are four central areas, uh, focus areas, and that was flows, habitat, water quality, and water management slash infrastructure. Um, you know, <clears throat> from chapter four of the report on, the, the report follows this organization. And so um, it, as you move on from chapter four, really the meat and potatoes of the plan, which we don't have a ton of time to get into this afternoon, um, but I'd be happy to get into some side conversations or to come back for um, a deeper dive. Slide six, please. So chapter six and seven of the report uh, present the strategies and potential projects for both near-term and long-term implementation. Uh, in the near-term, we have a laundry list of specific items to focus on for each of the central themes. Uh, and as you can see, flow dominates nearly all of these items outlined here. So um, it's important that Longmont um, you know, have, it, have a, a seat front and center at the table um, so that we can continue this great partnership and, and really move into phase two. Um, you know, we have a, 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 just a laundry list of items here. Um, all, some of these are, are going to require a, a, a deeper dive, you know, with some focus groups. Others, uh, we think we have some projects that are, are ready to be funded here. So uh, with the next slide, as we start to look uh, to the next steps, I think it's important to take a step back and, and survey the landscape with regard to partners in this basin. You know, many areas of Colorado struggle to bring folks to the table um, for big endeavors, big water projects like this, but that's certainly not the case with our basin. We have highly motivated folks at the county with Trout Unlimited, with Left Hand Watershed Center, uh, and then of course with Longmont and then the district and, and amongst many others. And, you know, everybody wants to take control, wants to write grants for implementation. And so we're gonna have to be very strategic with how we approach implementation. And, um, you know, there's gonna be inst instances where the district is best suited to lead um, and other instances where we're, you know, we, we have a, our, our best fit is in a supporting role. And this is certainly the case with everyone. So um, I'm excited to use this SMP as a launching point uh, to go fundraise, to, to bring money to our basin, to, to really make a difference and to, to bring us forward with, you know, not only modernization of, of a lot of our infrastructure, our aging infrastructure in the basin, but to continue that strong legacy of, of conservation uh, in the St. Vrede at left hand. And with that, I'd be happy to answer some questions. Great, thank you, Jason. Um, are there any questions? And please feel free to speak up. I can't see everybody on the screen at one time here. Um, Jason, I do have, I guess I'll start off with a question. Um, you mentioned in terms of, you know, flow and trying to meet objectives and um, stream health and management and flow obviously is key to that. Have you been working with Longmont staff in terms of button rock operations or is that going to be part of a future 
kind of phase in the project? Just kind of curious how that, that fits in, given how important that is to the, the river flows. Yeah, you bet. So um, I came in at the, the 11th hour of this process. I was hired on in July, but I, I have had some conversations with Longmont staff, and I know that it was a topic of discussion at, at a lot of the stakeholder meetings. Um, it, it, is, it is touched on in the report, but just mentioned at a high level um, that we would look to sit down with Longmont staff and try to develop um, some uh, you know, reservoir operation uh, scenarios, if you will, uh, that might be able to, to provide mutual benefit in the basin. And so that it's listed in the report. There aren't a lot of specifics on that. And, and that was uh, intentional. Sean, do you have anything else you'd elaborate on there? Yeah, if, if, if I could, um, many on the uh, board uh, are either aware of this or know this, but there, there was a time where Longmont um, was very active in, in making releases, particularly in the winter time, uh, that provided mutual benefits, and that that was through Longmont's leadership and the and the state of Colorado, through a variety of different policies and interpretation on on decrees and administration, um, really uh, challenged Longmont's ability to continue to be able to do that, and it, and it hasn't been done for some years. And staff could certainly speak to the specifics around that. Um, I I think it was partly a motivating factor in Longmont's participation to really sort of shed a light that. The administration of the river oftentimes uh, presents really collaborative, creative, uh, multi-benefit management of water supplies. And so um, through now the, the stream management plan having science to demonstrate what the needs of the river might be, uh, we can utilize that to have conversations with the state about uh, how much flexibility we might have in, in collective management of, of supplies, not to just shed a light singularly on, on Longmont, but you could look at a variety of different ways that we manage water supplies across the basin. And, and at least now we have a, a state sanctioned report that we could talk to the state and say, you know, something doesn't square here. Um, Chairperson Williams, if I may. Um, you mentioned some projects that are ready to be funded. Um, would you mind elaborating on that, please? Yeah, so I think that there are several areas that, that have been noted that are that were not restored after the 2013 flood event. So there, there are several key areas of stream restoration. Uh, there's a lot of aging infrastructure in, in this basin that um, you know, could, could use retrofit, could use replacement, um, could use upgrading altogether. Um, you know, as it pertains to infrastructure, those are more uh, complex conversations because of the, the various ownership structures. And so um, we've already started to have some of those conversations and, and Longmont has been a part of those as to how we best tackle these really important issues on the stream moving forward. And if, if I could add to that, sometimes projects is, is used as a term of art um, with these kind of processes. And so the, the management conversation on, on how we collectively as water users manage water supplies, um, and as I said earlier, uh, creating those multiple benefits could, could in and of itself be a project, quote unquote. Um, so that's definitely something that's described in the plan as well. And on the water quality side of things, that it's fairly well established some of our, our real problem areas, some of our legacy mines. And so those are ongoing projects that, that require more funding and require further development. And so that they are established at this point. I've got an additional question. I, I know, you know, at the last election, um, you guys were able to get some additional funding source through a increase in the mill levy. How does that play into kind of the future funding of, you know, the projects that you identify as part of the plan? Um, and then I assume maybe that also gives you some leverage with the state on partnering or leveraging some funding to get projects done. Just if, I don't know if you've, it's been pretty recent since you got that. I don't know if you've given some thought as to how that all comes together. Let me take that, Jason. Yeah, I think that Sean was going to present on that one a little bit as well. So maybe this is a good turning point. Yeah, I, and I could I could give a little bit of that answer, and then and then uh, slides will touch on the rest of it. But um, 
it, it is early in the process. It, it, it just approved in November. We don't start receiving the money um, until January and then periodically throughout the year. Um, so the, the St. Brandon Left Hand Water Conservancy District Board of Directors are going through prioritization exercises to identify uh, what opportunities might be out there to, to best maximize those dollars. Absolutely, a matching of grants is is one that's going to be a, a top priority of the board. It, for every dollar that that the taxpayers granted us, if we could leverage that with a, a dollar from the state, um, that's just better money spent here. So that that'll certainly be in the mix. Um, <clears throat> but the the stream management plan, uh, as well as the district's recently approved business plan, will be the lenses at which the uh, board of directors go through that prioritization exercise. Thanks, Sean. Any other questions? I don't see any other. Sean, were you you were going to give another? Um, yeah, Heather, if, if you could queue up some other slides, I'd just uh, take a couple more minutes if we have it just to uh, uh, thank all of you as Longmont residents and voters on your recent approval of, of what the ballot called 7A. Next slide. So this was uh, put on the ballot as a result of uh, the board of directors uh, recently adopted business plan uh, that is uh, was adopted in February, 2020. Next slide. So what 7A uh, asked the voters for is a, a 1.25 mil increase. Uh, as of uh, in 2020, our mill was 0.156. Uh, so this was a 1.25 mil increase to that uh, dedicated to what, what we told the voters is a five point plan um, that that is basically the business plan that the graphic showed you a little bit earlier um, that at the time we we believe that to generate about three point three million dollars per year uh, with with this year's assessed property values going into 2021. It looks more like three point four million uh, with some of the new properties coming online. Uh, we also told the voters it would have a 10 year sunset. So what we're looking at in way of implementation timeline is uh, something over the next, uh, or some things over the next 10 years. Next slide, please. So this was really a, a collaborative effort in working cooperatively with a, a variety of different uh, partners and stakeholders. This is just all the logos of the folks that actually publicly endorsed 7A. And you'll see here um, quite a diversity in agricultural, um, uh, nonprofit, um, uh, commercial and enterprise folks all from this area uh, and state and national organizations. Next slide, please. There was also a great deal of, of folks who were aware of the five point plan and the, and the business plan and the ballot question and for a variety of reasons, um, didn't necessarily publicly endorse it, uh, but were, were aware of what we were doing and providing feedback through the whole process. Next slide, please. So the, uh, the voters approved it nearly 70%, 60, 67.81% to be exact. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? Next slide, please. Just go ahead and uh, Heather, if you could click through real quick. And that's it there. So uh, the five point action plan is watershed protection and water security, improve our water IQ, strengthen agriculture, creek improvement facilities, and improve conservation. And what the business plan talks about is there's programs, projects, and services within each of those five categories or five points. So on the slide, it's, it's a little difficult to see, um, but uh, underneath each of those five points within the, the color shaded box are programs, projects, and services. And some uh, may be of interest to you, but due to time, we, don't, we can't go into that. Um, so we do have uh, information online that you can read on our website, or as Jason alluded to earlier, we're happy to come back and do a deeper dive if, if the board chose. But uh, we're really excited about <clears throat> uh, all of these programs, projects, and services. And as I mentioned earlier, the board is now going through a prioritization exercise to determine how to most efficiently start utilizing the 3.4 million this year, the 3. Point whatever next year and, and so on and so forth. And collectively over that 10 year period, uh, really have what, what I call a, a, a net positive impact to the basin with, with multi-use approaches. You'll see in here stream management plan implementation, you'll see in stream flows, uh, you see education and so on. So uh, we're really excited about the diversity of, of, of ideas that come to the table and, and having a dedicated source of funding to, to really look at uh, water issues on a watershed scale is uh, really excited for the basin. Next slide, please. 
said happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Sean? Sorry, I'm cycling through the folks on the call here. Um, you know, one question, Sean, or maybe just a comment would be, you know, it sounds like you're rolling the plan out. Now you're trying to kind of put the dollars in place to start implementing it. I, I feel from my perspective, it'd be good to have you report back as you kind of formalize that plan and how you're going to maybe allocate resources. And then, you know, as we talked earlier of Longmont's operations may fit into that. Maybe that's a good point where coming back to us and given more specifics as to how the plan will roll out and then maybe also specifics as to how Longmont's operations um, potentially could fit into, you know, uh, meeting some of the goals. I think, at least from my perspective, that'd be a good point maybe to, to report back to us. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other kind of comments or, or questions on that. I don't see yeah, any. The, 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 this is Sean. We'd be happy to. And if, 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 we want to put a placeholder in the, the board expects to kind of get through its um, ideas and thinking around it uh, around the maybe as late as February. So uh, if, if there was an opportunity to be on the agenda in maybe March or April, that might be a good, good timing. I'd definitely be in favor of that. Um, is anybody else have a thought on that? I, I think that'd be great just so we could track given obviously the, importance of Longmont in the plan and also the kind of overall, you know, impact potentially to Longmont system. I think that's a, a good check-in point. So I, I appreciate that. Anything else, um, <clears throat> Jason or Sean, or any questions or comments from the board? No, thank you for the opportunity to, to present to you. As Kevin said, some of this may be um, new to, to some of the board members. And uh, as Jason alluded to earlier, if you want to take a conversation offline, we're, we're happy to talk to you and take as much time as you want to walk through any one of these elements, the stream management plan or the business plan, but happy to present it to you and looking forward to circling back with you in March or April and um, get further feedback. Great. Well, thank you, Jason and Sean. Thanks for the presentation today. Thank you. And thank you for supporting the stream management plan. Those uh, matching funds go a long ways when uh, we're writing grants. Thank you. All right. With that, I'll, um, I'll keep moving on here in the agenda. I think we're on item six, which is agenda revisions and, and submission of documents. Ken or Wes, um, Nelson, anything there that we need to be aware of? I have none. I have none. Okay. All right. Um, we'll keep moving. Um, item seven is development activity, and it doesn't look west. There's no development activity that we need to review today. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> eight, general business, and the uh, one item we have there is for uh, cash and lieu review. Yeah, so I'm going to go through with the board. Uh, just a few of the highlights. Um, so as you've all seen, we are looking at uh, three primary criteria for this review. There was a few Lake McIntosh and oligarchy ditch shares that were transacted in this last quarter at an average cost of $15,100 per acre foot. The cost for new water supplies, um, we looked at that more specifically. We looked at the Bureau of Reclamation's uh, construction cost index uh, to make an adjustment for that. We noticed that it was less than 1%, 0.7% actually was the, was the difference between quarters. And that was the only real information that we had that was of significant contribution towards this particular criteria. So what you're seeing there is the same or essentially unchanged from the last quarter. Um, on the CBT allocation, there was a total of 54 units that were transacted at an average cost of $73,209 per acre foot. Uh, that's a little lower than we saw in the, the last quarter, where it was just about, just a little over 78,000 an acre foot. So it's down about 5,000 acre foot from last quarter. We had a couple um, initial uh, transactions are not completed, but in December, 
there was about 60 units that transacted at around 74,000. So this this uh, number that we have here, 73,209, is seems to be a pretty good uh, finger on the pulse of, of where that's at. I'll remind Water Board that cash in lieu is currently at $17,683. So pretty close to where we're seeing that cost of new water supply. Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, like uh, make note that of the 54 units that were transacted in this quarter, uh, 25, I'm sorry, 21 of those, the buyers were uh, uh, irrigation with an average cost of just over 77,000. So what we're seeing here is, you know, it, it used to be there was quite a difference between uh, the buyers being developers or irrigators. And now, uh, at least in this quarter, not so much. And so um, really, I guess the, the overall theme of, of this is that there wasn't a whole lot of change from the last quarter. Um, so if there's other questions, um, I'd be happy to try to answer those for you. Thanks, Wes. Any questions um, for Wes on this? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So, Wes, if I understand right, um, we've been setting it to date based on the Winnie Gap firming project costs, which um, is $17,683 per acre foot. And you're saying that's the same as what it was um, the prior quarter when we set it. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and then if, if we were to stay at that same price, um, do you need a motion to, to do so? Or what do you need from us in, in terms of um, setting or is, <clears throat> keeping that same price? I don't, I don't need a motion. If, if uh, we can just reflect the minutes that that's the board's uh, determination to, to leave it where it's at now until the next quarterly review. Okay, um, any, I guess I just open that up for the, the water board any questions or comments on that? That's the way we've set it, obviously. And I think we're going to get into this a little bit later in the Windy Gap firming project update. Um, there's been some pretty major news in terms of ability to move that project forward. Um, and that's the project we've been pegging. The cost of that project is what we've been pegging our um, cash and loot um, to for a number of years now. So I don't know if anybody has any other thoughts or would like to discuss um, a different um, cash and loot price. Otherwise, we'll, we'll just leave it where it's at. Feel free to chime in if you have any comments or questions on that. Okay. Um, I don't see anybody um, objecting to that. So Wes, why don't we go ahead and keep it at the, the current rate um, and then we can uh, mo <clears throat> monitor that and see if we need to adjust it in future quarters going forward. So, very good. Um, great, thank you. So, with that, we're on to item um, nine, and nine A is a monthly water supply update. Um, Wes. Yeah. So we wanted to just continue to follow up. Um, normally, we would start giving water board. Uh, kind of monthly updates. This is at the front end of the uh, kind of the snowpack season. But um, as you recall, back in um, October, when we talked to the board, we were uh, facing some fires and pretty dry conditions. So we decided that for this month and months upcoming, we would just continue to provide you um, some information on our overall water supply um, and so I've got a, a short uh, PowerPoint presentation. Basically, it'll go along with uh, the textual information we included in your, in your packet where I wanted to just highlight a few um, key parts. And then towards the end of the presentation, Ken will speak a little bit uh, on the fire impacts. And then there again, as always, if you have some questions or anything, uh, we can address those at that, at that time. So, um, like to start with the uh, the next slide. So as the board may recall, um, we continue to operate under the water supply and drought management plan, which uh, is for us to be in a sustainable conservation level that was uh, directed by city council 
back in July. So that's where we're at to date. Next slide. Stream flows uh, from, for almost all of 2020 water year were below average. And this kind of indicates that the uh, solid blue line is what we actually saw. The gray line above it was the, the average. Um, there were certain periods of time where our stream flow was a third or even a fourth of normal. I think currently we're about half of what we normally would see. That would be kind of that nine CFS of the 17 CFS average. So continuing to stay a little below, uh, below normal. Next slide. I know this slide is kind of hard to see, but what we wanted to speak to on this, local storage is slightly below average. So in other words, the five-year average, we took um, about a dozen and a half reservoirs in our basin. Normally at the start of December, we would have those at about 66% full. We actually seen them to be about 62% percent full. And so slightly below average, but not, not anything overwhelmingly to concern ourselves. One point is the uh, note, as Nelson mentioned, uh, Button Rock is full, which we normally would have seen that being down. However, Union is more down than it normally is. So there's kind of a balancing of, of the reservoirs. But as a whole, we're slightly below average. Next slide, please. So again, Ralph Price Reservoir being uh, being full and spilling. Nelson mentioned about 10 CFS. We're hopeful that we can have our repairs done by the end of February, early March. Um, and I, I'm not going to steal Jason's thunder when he talks about that more specifically on, under our item 9D. Next slide. Union Reservoir, again, as I mentioned, um, and as Nelson did, we were down about 4,500 acre feet. Um, one thing that I'd like to uh, speak to is to fill Union Reservoir, it, it takes a little bit longer. Union Reservoir is an off-channel reservoir that fills off the oligarchy ditch. And with just the operational history of that, um, it normally would take a month or two to fill Union, regardless of how much flow is in the St. Vrain Creek, just from the standpoint of what the oligarchy can handle. And so it's likely that early, earlier this year, it could be as early as January, it might be in March or April, but sometime earlier, it's likely that we may be releasing uh, some water out of Button Rock. Um, the, the value of that is that um, Button Rock being an on-channel reservoir has the ability to to store quicker, physically store quicker. We also have more decrees available to store in Button Rock than we do just in Union alone. And so we're gonna try to continue to do our best management practice and do some operational things that will hopefully at the end of a, uh, the runoff season that we can realize Union and Button Rock being full. Uh, next slide, please. So the Longmont water uh, treatment plants are on pace to uh, produce about 104% of what we've seen in 2002. And we kind of use that as a monitor or as a benchmark. That's when we started doing our water supply and drought management plans. Um, so interestingly, over that 19 year period, we're just slightly over it, even though our population has increased. And that's a a testament to some of the water conservation as uh, um, things that uh, the city has done. Um, in comparison, if you kind of hard to see, I understand, but in 2019, we did about 16,000 acre feet. So we were, we're going to do about 2000 acre feet more than last year. But if you looked at the whole 19 year period, the average was about 17,000. So we're Nothing real surprising. Um, I think we're, we're right on track to what we were expecting. Next slide, please. So um, the snowpack for the South Platte Basin, as Nelson mentioned, we were at 76% uh, of normal and on the upper Colorado at about 73% of normal. Um, 
kind of bear in mind that the snowpack this early part of the season is probably barely a quarter percent of the snow that we would uh, normally experience. And so with each passing uh, waterboard review period, you know, it'll become more and more important. I think one thing to note is you can see on that green line how a single event can really make a difference. And so we're hoping that we'll have a couple significant snowpacks and early on would be nice. But as always, it's those spring storms that will really make or break um, our water supply. But as of right now, we're, we're below average, but nothing to, to overly concern ourselves with at this point. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Pleasant Valley Reservoir, if you were to look specifically at our local storage, you'll note that Pleasant Valley Reservoir is down. Um, it's about 25% of full. And um, it is the call on the river, as Nelson mentioned. Um, we are putting water in there. Um, likely it will have realized its full decree by the end of this month. And um, in so doing, uh, we'll probably be somewhere around a third full. And then we'll have to wait until either uh, the call on the river changes so that it can fill under one of its enlargement decrees, or we can put other water rights that are decreed to go in there. Um, you'll notice back in 2018, when we were doing some work there, we were actually uh, less full than we are now. And in that given year, um, we ended up filling it to about 80%. So we're thinking, even though it's down uh, quite a bit, that there's everything indicates that we should be able to get it within three fourths or even full before the end of the runoff. We'll see how the snowpack does. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that's kind of on the water supply piece. The, uh, the, the other piece that we wanted to speak to was kind of some of the fire impacts. And we wanted to speak to that this month. Now, going forward, there really won't be a whole lot more to say, but we wanted to highlight five of the major fires that were in um, along the front range, all of which have now been uh, contained. Um, so when you uh, look at them, you can see there's, there's a fairly significant amount of, of um, acreage that was burned. There was uh, just under 450,000 acres represented by these five fires. So if you were to kind of rough that out, you're talking an area from Longmont up to Fort Collins and over to Greeley. So pretty big total area. Um, fortunately, most of these were outside of the, uh, the direct uh, watershed, but I think uh, at this point, Ken, I'm gonna let Ken go ahead and uh, he, there, speak to the kind of the remaining slides and the few that actually may have some contribution in terms of water quality for the St. Verain. Thank you, Wes. Um, did wanna kind of bring the board up to speed on where we are with the fires. You know, uh, most people, read the 100% containment and the fact that most of the fires are out um, and, and, and kind of, it, it's real easy to kind of forget about it. Um, unfortunately, um, all three of the fires uh, did and are going to uh, impact us, um, but it, that impact will be felt really in the future. Um, I'll really start with the smallest fire I'll call it small. It's the largest fire ever in Boulder County, <laughs> but that's the Calwood fire at 10,000 acres. Um, it's still a sizable fire. Um, next slide, please. So the Calwood fire, um, this slide is uh, basically what we call an erosion, erodibility uh, map. This shows where um, the, the, the little bit larger concern of erodibility is. And there's really two factors. The two primary factors in erodibility are um, how hot the fire burned and then how steep the terrain is uh, where the fire burned. So um, this map shows if, if you, if you kind of envision the, the larger area is about the Eastern three fourths of it, you'll see you'll see a, a green area right and kind of just west of the middle, 
But that whole area is the Gear Canyon area. From, from that, you know, from that marker there going east, that's Gear Canyon. So the bulk of the fire actually burnt in the left-hand uh, basin, although the left-hand creek does come to Longmont. And so it, it, that will impact us um, eventually as, as the ash laden and silt um, come down from that area. Most of that area is uh, Boulder County open space and uh, US Forest Service property. So um, the, the one thing I, I do have to do a little bit of a shout out to the, to the Boulder County open space. They have done a really good job at working, looking at doing um, rehab and uh, uh, they've already turned in a project uh, to the Natural Resources Conservation Service through their emergency watershed protection program. And they will be doing a lot of work up there um, on um, putting down aerial mulch and seeding and, and really doing a lot of the fire recovery efforts in that area. The area on the west side of the map, basically from that green spot over, that whole area is, is called the Central Gulch area. The fire started um, really on the far west side of this uh, burn area in the Calwood Education Center. That's where they got the name Calwood Fire um, and then burnt, burnt to the east. So that whole area on the west side is Central Gulch. That's all Central Gulch um, eventually drains down into the South St. Vrain Creek. And then uh, would um, that drainage would go on down South St. Vrain to the town of Lyons over, over our diversion structures on the South St. Vrain on into the main stem of the St. Vrain Creek uh, where the North and South come together in Lyons and then we'll come on East. Um, so looking at this erodibility map, you can see, and primarily because of the steepness of the terrain, um, some of the most erodible areas are on Central Gulch. We were initially, um, and, and just for information's sake, this is, all these erodibility maps tend to be a little um, on the high side, <laughs> uh, um, just, just the way it works out. Uh, we, we are certainly hoping that, um, especially the, the north part of Central Gulch, uh, burnt very, um, the burn was much cooler, um, at be, mostly because it was coming down the canyon, coming down the walls of the South St. Rain Canyon. And as the fire goes down, it doesn't tend to flare up as much. And so um, it, it, it didn't burn quite as bad. Um, in fact, go ahead and go to the next slide. This is the bottom end of Central Gulch. This is about three quarters of a mile upstream of the intersection of uh, St. Rain Creek, South St. Rain Creek. Um, the fire didn't quite make it down to this point. And, and the point of this picture was just to kind of show you, you can kind of see the, the damage from the 2013 flood. The, the bottom of this valley is fairly open and and um, large, large rock and cobble um, from the flood, and uh, but but there's good uh, there's good timber on the sides. There's there there is good uh, downfall logs. Um, uh, you go about another quarter of a mile and you hit the fire, and luckily at this part of the fire, you actually if you could have a prescribed burn and, and have a perfect fire, that's what we had there. It actually burnt the understory, but didn't even get up into the crown of the trees. And so you go about another half a mile before you really get into to where the, the trees were burnt um, up in the crown. So the good news for us, we were originally very concerned about what was gonna happen with Central Gulch. Still concerned, we're still gonna watch it. We're still gonna work with the county and the US Forest Service to try to get some um, work done on the upper parts of it. but. Um, it appears that at least from a woody debris and hopefully from a, a, a sediment load, um, this, the effect of the 2013 flood um, will help keep some of that woody debris or most of it up there and hopefully a good portion of the granular debris. So really we will have ash um, because it will be suspended in the water and it'll be coming down. So we'll have some pretty good ash flows come out of here um, but we'll put in, 
we'll be working with the county and the U.S. Forest Service to get in some rain gauges to get us some um, advanced warning and we can shut off uh, water intakes during the worst of the, of the rainstorm events that would bring that down. So um, that's pretty much kind of right now where we are with the Calwood fire. Um, that, that since that bird into our basin, that, that will have the greatest impact. Um, luckily it won't have an impact all winter because there, there won't be major runoff events. It'll really be next uh, late May, June, July, early August when the big rain thunderstorm type events come and, and um, really flush that um, canyon out. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. This is the uh, East Troublesome Fire. Um, it's um, probably the most problematic fire we have. It burnt um, really a good portion of the uh, CBT collection system. And so that's gonna be one of the things that we'll have to be watching very, very closely. Um, the good thing is we've already had one good meeting with Northern staff uh, on post-fire recovery efforts. Um, and and I, again, I'll hand it to Northern. They are taking this seriously. They've uh, set up an entire interdisciplinary team that is working on um, fire recovery. They've set up um, some operational um, planning that, that, that will help. The good thing about this fire is that it, ha it hasn't impacted any water quality yet. And all winter long, we'll be bringing over the CBT water. So we'll have the west east slope, Carter and Horse Tooth completely full of uh, clean water before any of the thunder summer thunderstorms hit. Um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the fire itself, um, the big part of the fire um, really was in um, the Willow Creek. Uh, the worst part of the fire was in the Willow Creek Basin, but the Willow Creek Basin only makes up 13% of the CBT uh, system. So that's um, probably an area where we'll be able to do some shunning of some of the water um, to keep it out of the system. 25% uh, of the watershed is the Colorado River um, uh, area, and that's really west and north of Grand Lake, and then east going up into the Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, the, the, the fire that went up straight north of Grand Lake up into the Kawanichi Valley part of the park um, didn't burn too hot. Uh, that's mostly open meadow. Um, and and I, I really am uh, cautiously optimistic that a lot of that will green up before the, some of the big thunderstorms. Uh, the more problematic part is um, North Inlet Creek, which is kind of west or northeast and east of Grand Lake, and then uh, Tumblesome Creek, which is the north part of that uh, burn in Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, those were pretty big fires, pretty hot fires, and, and those unfortunately drain directly into Grand Lake. So their impacts will will be felt right into Grand Lake and there's not much we can do about that. Um, can't, can't really change that. And so uh, the good part of the trouble, part about the troublesome uh, drainage is that about half of that burnt in the, around 2012 in that last drought. So the upper part of that had already burnt. And so it would, it would not have burnt very hot in this fire and should green up um, and, and really not create too big of a problem. Uh, and another good part of it's an area called Big Meadow, which again, that will, that burnt, but that will green up uh, quickly too. Still a lot of area up there, but it's the North Inlet Creek that'll probably be the biggest impact. So that will really impact us a year from now as, as that impacts the West Slope water. And uh, a year from now, when we bring in over that water, um, we, might, we might have some concerns. It did, it did jump the Continental Divide and uh, burn down into the Moraine Park area. But in talking with uh, Northern Water staff, they're fairly confident that uh, that won't impact um, the CBT system too bad. Um, part of that had already burnt uh, in the Cub Creek fire, Moraine Park fire about uh, eight or nine years ago. 
uh, and part of it didn't burn too hot because it was fairly high elevation. Uh, the higher your elevation, the, the less heat you get on your fire generally. So um, while that did burn a good area, um, we, um, Northern feels less concerned about that. And I'll go ahead in the next slide. Um, this is just a blow up of that uh, Moraine Park area and the troublesome uh, gulch area. So that's really the kind of the, the biggest part. Um, a lot of people working on that at Northern Water and a lot of people working on it with the Bureau of Reclamation, Grand County. It's amazing the people have come together to, to start helping out already on the West Slope. So um, we'll, we'll keep you updated on that. And uh, that's more of a long-term issue for us. Um, next slide, please. And I think that was it. So we are um, keeping an eye on these fires. We'll keep an eye on them. It's, uh, it was a little scary when you think the, the Calwood fire burnt to within a mile and a half of the North St. Rain Basin on the south side, had it gone less than, less than one quarter mile more, it would have hit the side of the South St. Rain Canyon going up north and it would have climbed right up that canyon and been in the north pretty quick. So that's how close it was to our north drainage on the south. The East Troublesome Fire, once it burned over in the Moraine Park area, it actually burnt to within three miles of Estes Cone and the Estes Cone is kind of the north side drains into the Big Tops and the south side drains in to the um, North St. Brain. So we were within a mile and a half of the Calwood Fire, three miles of the East Troublesome Fire. And then the uh, Calwood Fire, when it made its run down south into the Big Thompson, was only 10 miles away from us. So we really had all three of those big fires literally within miles uh, of the North St. Brain Basin. So we're very fortunate it did not burn into this North St. Rain at all. And so uh, for Longmont, the best, best news is we should have good clean water supply from the North Basin, even if some of these other uh, basins are impacted a little bit. Um, so that's really all I have right now on the fires, but wanted to give you a quick update on them and uh, let you know we will continue to track them and continue to give you input on that. Thanks, Ken. Um, does the board have any questions or comments for Wes or Ken on the, the reports? Um, Roger, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, Ken, I don't want to belabor it too long, but two things that are on my mind. I didn't hear the causes of the starts of these fires. Were they natural or were, uh, were they man-made or do you know off the top of your head? Um, they, if, if they know, they haven't said yet. Um, they have not on any, all three of the fires, they haven't um, posted a, a, a reason. I, it, it's possible that they're investigating them or it's possible they got so big they couldn't figure it out. <laughs> but I, it hasn't been a cause that I'm aware of yet on any of them. One, one other question then, uh, how much of the, the burn was uh, helped, I guess, by uh, the amount of dry timber up there like pine beetle kill was that a big factor at all i know in grand lake there seemed to be a lot of that available to burn but i i don't know you know i um the the dry timber made it easy for it to burn but quite honestly the um drought this summer how dry it was the, the low extremely low soil moisture and extremely low humidity uh, creating extremely dry timber, even, even the live timber, uh, extremely dry. And then unfortunately, um, pretty thick timber everywhere and the winds. It was really the wind, um, some really terrible wind uh, conditions. That every time they came close to getting it corralled, the wind took it off and, and made it run. And so, it, it, you know, we, we had similar big fires in 2012, the last drought, big, bigger drought, um, as well as 2002. If you go back to, you know, the, we, it's usually during these drought periods that we have the big fires. Okay, thanks, Ken. 
Any other, oh, Allison, you have a question or comment? Yes, thank you. Um, I had two questions. One um, is involving snowpack and soil moisture. Um, is the snowpack to some degree going to replenish the soil moisture such that we're gonna realize even less um, down here? Um, yeah, uh, in, in fact, I would, I would say, you know, with the soil moisture conditions we're looking at right now, um, they're, they're extremely, were extremely dry before it started to snow. Um, it, it would, even if we had 100% snowpack, we'd be lucky to have a 75% runoff. Um, I'll let Wes elaborate, but um, it will impact it. Yeah, I think, and, and that's where sometimes these um, early snows help a little bit in that they come out uh, slower. If we have just those late spring snows, they're just, it's melting so fast that the ground can only absorb so much. And so it's going to be a combination of things, but Ken hit it on the head. It's, it's going to take an above average snowpack to be able to realize an average runoff, I think. Thank you. And second question was kind of circling back to your presentation, Wes. Um, I was wondering, this is kind of a elementary question, but what actually happens to the water post-treatment plant? Say that again, I'm sorry. Uh, what happens to the effluents once it's um, fully treated? So um, what we do is there's really two types of water that the water treatment takes, either fully consumable or single use. For the um, single use water that goes into the plants, that is just return down to St. Rain Creek at the wastewater treatment plant and it'd be available for the next uh, users in priority. For the fully consumable effluent that goes through the water treatment plant, um, we um, lease that either through long-term or short-term uh, leases. And so there's approximately a dozen uh, entities that we have lease arrangements with. And so um, we use nearly 100% of the wastewater treatment effluent. And we find that um, in most cases, that's insufficient to satisfy the full lease requirements. Thus, why we've been making releases out of uh, Union Reservoir to make up the difference. So um, in the winter time, um, we usually have uh, closer to um, 90 to 100 percent of the effluent that's available to us is fully consumable. And that's because we're taking water out of storage, out of button rock, that would have already been fully consumable water that was stored. Um, and so we're able to make uh, more complete use of the water in, in uh, the winter time, but nonetheless, that total amount that's being uh, uh, released from the wastewater treatment plant effluent is normally, again, not um, sufficient to meet our full lease obligations. And so there's always some that we're either uh, releasing his in-stream credits through St. Rain Creek or out of Union to fully satisfy those obligations. Thank you. And one follow-up question. What kind of percentages does it shake out in terms of fully consumable versus single use in the irrigation season? So um, it, it varies by month, but if we were to look at the irrigation season, um, I would say during the irrigation season, we're probably uh, a third or a half that would be available as reusable effluent. It really, again, it really depends on the call on the river and what water rights we have available to us. It also depends upon um, what the water treatment plant is using. We, we um, CBT being single use, but windy, uh, windy gap being uh, fully consumable. And so we're, we're, we usually try to manage those um, trans basin supplies that we take into the water treatment plant, the CBT and the windy gap. We like to run windy gap when we have a higher uh, uh, return flow credit factor. So oftentimes we'll run that windy gap earlier in the season to get more full and complete use. Um, we do have the ability though, if there ever becomes a time when the wastewater treatment plant effluent is above and beyond what our needs are, 
we can put that excess uh, into Union Reservoir. We can pump that into Union, and sometimes we have done that. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments for Ken or Wes? I, I do have one. Um, Ken, you had mentioned that under the Calwood fire, you guys are looking at putting maybe rain uh, monitors up um, to look and see if there's ash flows coming down. I assume then you'd, you know, turn off the diversion from the South St. Brain. Um, I, I know Fort Collins has done something similar where they look at turbidity or that in the Poudre River. Um, I, I guess um, is, is the intent that you'd have more, are you going to be monitoring the rain gauges and then looking in the river or is there a ability to put some sort of gauge, you know, in the river to uh, kind of monitor turbidity? and then turn off your diversions based upon, you know, if it gets too high, it may cause more of an issue to the treatment plant. Just kind of curious um, how you're going to handle that going into this year. Um, yes, that's, that's correct, Todd. We, we really want the rain gauges to give us the maximum forewarning, um, but really all that does is say, hey, it rained up here, and then we would have to use um, both visual and turbidity monitoring to determine when we would shut off. It, you know, if it gets to be a very significant rainstorm event, it will just automatically shut it off because we know what it's going to do. But um, if it's a, a quarter inch or a half inch, um, then, then we'd probably do it with turbidity monitoring. But our, pla our plants will, they do real time turbidity monitoring of all their sources. Okay, thanks, Ken. Any other questions, comments? Scott? Thank you. Uh, just a quick one, and I don't know if anybody has a definitive answer, but I think at a recent meeting where Brad Wind was speaking, he mentioned that the Northern Board may not um, uh, issue their quota uh, for the 2021 season at its April meeting, which is when we've historically seen that information that might be postponed into later into the summer, um, maybe May or June. And I didn't know if that affects our ability to, to uh, project our water supply, um, water demand um, considerations, or if that's gonna inconvenience us a fair amount. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't heard definitively that they were gonna postpone it. I, I did hear they were considering, or they just didn't mention, <laughs> they said we're not sure when we'll, we'll do that. I'd be surprised if they went clear into June because that really has more of an impact, that has a big impact on the irrigation companies. Um, they, they need to know how much water they're gonna have. Um, but yeah, for us, it would, it would be less than convenient if it were too late. But, and I um, might add that, or will you really use that information is when we put together our, you know, the next year's water supply and drought management plan, what it would probably require us is to then make some uh, assumptions instead of the facts. Um, one of the tools that, one of the re primary reasons they've always tried to get it out um, when they normally do is so that people can make some decisions in regards to um, taking any of the carryover water. Um, I think Longmont has, we, we as water resources staff is, have, have already um, kind of come to a conclusion that we're going to take our full entitlement of our carryover. So with that in mind, it's not going to be probably as much so that we have to wait for the final determination and our decision to take that carryover. You know, there's a lot of factors that's going to go into that. Some of that being the uncertainty of the water quality that uh, we may or may not experience here in the uh, native basin water rights. And two, some of the, when I talked about some of the storage that we have, we're, we've always tried to have a um, uh, play it on the safe side, if you will, and to um, be, be as much certain as possible that we have enough water. And so I think with those things in mind, it would be a, it would be more helpful if they could get it out, but if they were to wait a month or so, I think Longmont would still be able to come up with a, a reasonable assumption and a and still be able to put its water supply and drought management plan together 
um, at about the same time that we normally would have otherwise. I guess one comment, there has not been any definitive um, discussion or direction on that other than Brad's saying it may need to be considered from the board level, just so everybody's aware of that. So I think that'll be a discussion as we get further into the spring, um, just uh, so there hasn't been anything definitively decided there. Any other questions, comments um, from the board? I don't see any. Okay. With that, um, we'll go on to item 9B, which is a Windy Gap firming project update. Ken? Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a, a real quick update today on Windy Gap. Um, hopefully everybody um, received their email. The, the good news that the federal lawsuit was um, finally uh, got, a, got a, an order out and, and was great news. We, we won every single point. <laughs> Uh, in the in the case, and the and the judge upheld the issuance of the permit by the federal agencies. Um, that really really helps the project start um, to feel like it can move forward. Um, obviously, there's a, a potential for an appeal that that is not all that uncommon in a federal lawsuit like this. Um, the plaintiffs have. I believe 60 days um, from the time that the order was out. So that, that time will, um, run, won't run out till um, February, about February 10th. But um, so we'll, we a little bit of a waiting pattern here still yet. That being said, um, it did, one of the things the project needs to move forward with is relocation of the WAPA power lines by the Western Area Power Administration, and they can actually, they are actually going to start working on that. They were waiting for a ruling and um, they don't appear to be, you know, needing to wait to see if it's appealed or not. They're, they're gonna start working on that um, project, um, hopefully right away. Uh, of course it is the middle winter, so <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how that works, but um, that does allow that to, to start moving forward. Um, so uh, as a result, the project is, is actually calling for a special uh, participants meeting this Wednesday to talk with all of the uh, participants and, and let everyone weigh in on their, uh, their opinion of if anything moves forward or if, um, if we wait and, until the end of the appeal period um, and really where we go with uh, the project right now. Um, still, um, I mean, we're not, the project isn't ready to kick off anyway because still need to get all the funding in place before it can kick off. But uh, the timing of that funding, the timing of sales of bonds and things like that will really, really try to work that out in the next month or two. Um, as far as the project itself, um, the uh, Colorado River Connectivity channel design is now at a 40% design state. So that's good, um, getting, getting that project moving forward. Uh, the firming project itself, um, they've done an inspection on the Bald Mountain Tunnel and the inter potential interconnect to the reservoir from the CBT system and that all looked good. So that, that news is good. Um, Poudre Valley REA will start putting in project power lines. Um, I think they actually should have started by now. Um, and then uh, the draft air, air quality permit from the state of Colorado um, should be coming to us within a few weeks. So that was one of the last permits that, that needed. Um, it's not that it won't happen, it's just uh, what it says. Um, that, that should be coming fairly quickly. So. Uh, just a little bit more of a wait, uh, I guess, on, on the appeal period, but I think um, the project had a great milestone and, and should be starting to move forward. So happy to answer any questions on that, if there were any. Thanks, Ken. Any questions for Ken on Windy Gap update? I'm not seeing any. Um, 
with that, we'll move on to item 9C, the monthly legislative report. Um, Ken, it has you down again. Yeah, and um, honestly, I don't have a report this month yet. Um, obviously, this uh, legislative session won't start till next month. And I don't have the information from the interim legislative committee yet. I apologize for not being able to get that to you uh, yet today, but um, we'll we'll cover all that next month at the January meeting and, and go over that. Sounds good, yeah. It's on the items for tentatively scheduled future more board meetings so we can revisit that in January. Um, so with that, we'll move on to item 9D, the um, water resource engineering project update. And, Looks like we have an elf here named Jason that can fill us in. Go ahead. Hey, Merry Christmas, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jason Elkins, water resource engineer and project engineer for all of our capital projects. Um, I got three big uh, projects I want to update you on. Um, but real quick, um, I just wanted to add to kind of, uh, you had asked about the turbidity testing. Um, we've actually started taking some turbidity, um, some water quality samples and doing some analysis to try to figure out um, what the baseline turbidity and total suspended solids is in the South St. Vrain. Um, CDOT's got a project that's coming up this summer and they think that you know they might impact that. And with the Calwood fire, we just thought we'd take it upon ourselves. Let's just go ahead and just start doing some water quality analysis. So our water quality lab and our uh, Nelson Flander water treatment plant operators are doing um, uh, water quality analysis on that so we can get we can get a good baseline uh, prior to spring runoff and and all the debris coming down our way. Um, uh, let's talk about uh, button rock repairs. So as you might recall, we sprung a leak um, over the summer up at Button Rock and uh, we currently have the emergency gate closed and we have the regulating gate completely torn apart. Um, we're currently um, uh, actively trying to get these repairs done so that we can put this all back together and have it up and uh, operating uh, come the middle of February. Um, there's quite a, quite a bit of repairs. It's pretty extensive, um, but it's fully achievable. With, we're, we're totally confident that we can do it. Um, you know, there's just a couple things that add some time to it. Um, Lead-based paint, you know, so it's like we got to properly dispose of that. That takes time. Um, but uh, I, I think we're going to have Button Rock put back together and back into service um, the second week of February. That's what we're uh, tentatively um, scheduled, scheduled for. Um, the South St. Vrain Pipeline Pump Station. Um, so I'm actually meeting with the Town of Lyons tonight to try to secure um, our permanent easement to install the pump station uh, just south of the Lions Fire Protection District. If you're familiar with the town of Lyons, uh, right, right just south of the Fire uh, Protection District is a vacant lot uh, where our South St. Vrain pipeline runs through. So working with them to get uh, an easement big enough um, for us to install that and uh, I fully anticipate that they're going to um, approve it tonight. Um, the design for that, uh, we're currently getting ready to advertise an RFP uh, request for proposal for a um, pump station manufacturer. So we're looking to, we already have Burns and McDonald on board as our uh, engineer consultants, but we're going to have um, uh, prefabricated uh, manufacturer um, come on board um, to start, you know, start the design and uh, uh, the design and the fabrication of that to have that delivered come June. So anyway, that's should be going out to bid by the end of this week. And hopefully by the end of January, we'll know um, who's going to be making the, uh, the pump station. Um, as for the South St. Vrain pipeline rehab project, um, unfortunately that's hit a bit of a delay. Um, I don't know if you guys recall a couple of weeks ago that there was a couple up in Gilpin County that had died from uh, um, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, it was, I, I don't know the details, but it sounds like it was some sort of accident or something. So anyway, one of those two people was the 
project manager at CNL Water Solutions, who was in charge of our project. And so she passed away. Um, she was, I mean, she's one of their founding project managers. So it's been pretty hard for CNL. Um, I told them, take as much time as they need. I, I get it. You, you lost a family member just as much as you did uh, a coworker. So um, I, I'm anticipating that's going to put about a one month delay on that. But with the pump station project starting construction in June, it's really inconsequential. Um, it would be nice to get the South St. Vrain pipeline up and running prior to the pump station so we can, you know, put it back into service and at least, you know, do some testing, some flow testing and stuff on that. Um, but if we don't make that, it just, it's just going to end up delaying it, you know, months, a few months. So it, it's, it's unfortunate and it's sad, um, but it's, you know, we'll, we'll work through it and we'll make up the lost time and um, we'll get the South St. Vrain. I fully plan on having that thing back up and running um, 100% by the end of next year. Any questions? Any questions for Jason? I am not awesome. seeing any. Great. Thanks, Thank you for the report, Jason. No problem. Okay, we're on to 9E, which is a water conservation sustainability update. Is Francie out there? Yes, um, hope everyone's doing well today. Um, I have an update on four different water conservation items from this past fall. Um, the board may remember that this past summer, you all provided feedback on the Climate Action Task Force water conservation recommendation. Uh, city staff reviewed board feedback combined with a analysis process to provide a implementation timeline and modifications on all climate action task force recommendations. They were passed earlier in December. So the water conservation recommendation, which originally had the goal of a 35 to 40% reduction by 2025, staff modified that goal to instead similar to what Water Board recommended, um, continue with current water conservation and drought management plans until the, the 2024 Water Efficiency Master Plan update, where a more extensive analysis of, a more, of the benefits of a more, uh, more ambitious water conservation goal should be analyzed and returned to City Council at that time. So that effort essentially has been put on um, kind of, well, not put on hold because we'll still continue water conservation and drought management efforts, but this analysis of a more ambitious water conservation goal probably won't begin until sometime in 2023. Uh, another update is that this past September staff from a number of different divisions, including planning, parks, water resources, attended the Water Smart Growing Water uh, sorry, Growing Water Smart uh, workshop from the um, Sonarin Institute. From that, we created an action plan focused on how to better integrate water efficiency and land use planning to meet the goals of our water efficiency master plan and, and envision Longmont. So that one year, ac it's a one year action plan. Staff is currently in the process of presenting it to different leadership among the city, but the primary goal was to figure out how the uh, city staff can further integrate water efficiency into the development process. So staff will be meeting monthly to kind of update and make sure that water conservation is continue to be integrated into other parts of the city more so than it has in the past. I do want to highlight that we did find while going to that workshop, Longmont actually is a little bit ahead of other communities in kind of connecting planning and water resources, primarily because our, our water utility and planning are all within the city, but we did identify areas that we can continue to improve. Um, the Another opportunity that, that we actually just applied to is the Water Now Accelerator. It's a project accelerator. Uh, we just applied earlier this month and we applied to get some best practices research support because uh, we will, a lot of our AMR data will be coming in hopefully by the end of the first quarter next year, because we'll have a lot of the, the system set up to receive that data. 
So we wanted to have some best practice research from experts in the water conservation field of how to best use that data. So we will hopefully find out, I think next month, whether we received that project accelerator support. So I'll update the board if that is the case. Um, and then lastly, uh, we partner with Resource Central every year for a number of water conservation programs. And next year we will be the first community to launch a income qualified garden in a box program. So if you're familiar with garden in a box, cities usually partner to provide a $25 discount. We had been hearing that for not, that's not accessible for all of our residents. So those who are participate in Longmont Cares, which is a income qualified program can now also participate in a 80% discount on a garden in a box. And we're hoping that will help reach more members of our community uh, with those waterwise gardens. So those are four very different updates on things happening with water conservation. Uh, but uh, are there any questions? Thanks, Francie. Any questions that the board has on the updates to the conservation plans? Um, Francie, I, I do have one. I, I think it'd be the growing water smart. I don't know it, at some point in the future, if it makes sense to make a, another kind of specific presentation on that, I'd be kind of interested in seeing how you're integrating kind of water resource, um, water conservation with um, future development. Um, and, and part of that may be as we look to the future water demands and the build out for the city of Longmont, you know, maybe we can get some more indication as to, you know, what is that appropriate or achievable level of conservation so that we can, you know, kind of look at water supply and demand and kind of get a better idea of, you know, where are we with in terms of meeting that future demand. Um, anyway, I, I, I know Northern was kind of help facilitating some of those presentations. I think that's a great program and glad to see that Longmont participated, but is that something you could report back to us on at a future meeting? Um, yes, that is something we could report back. I also, it also sounds um, like a lot of, I just want to make sure I heard your request co correctly, besides understanding maybe the different components of the action plan and how we're trying to better, a lot of the efforts we found were on how we better educate developers, but um, also kind of bring back how we're uh, meeting the water demand and water supply, which I assume would be more of a conversation uh, presented by Ken. Yeah, Francie, I guess what I'm curious of is, you know, one of the the things as I understand it would be there, there may be ways to, you know, do, you know, less bluegrass, more xeric, you know, really reduce those future landscape demands in certain areas that would have a corresponding reduction um, in future water demands. So, and I don't know if, if you guys got into that or how that kind of the, um, you know, with the cost of water, what I'm seeing is a lot of developers are trying to figure out ways they can reduce their um, cost of development. And one way to do that is to do more um, kind of low water use plants or landscaping. And I don't know, that's kind of what I was curious. I don't know if that's being integrated into the planning documents. Um, and then that would have a corresponding impact on, you know, the future water demand. So it, it may be one that may take a little bit of time before that all kind of flushes out of how it would be integrated into the future kind of planning documents. And then what those changes would mean in terms of future reductions in water demand, if that makes sense. That, that's kind of what I'm, I'm kind of curious of going forward. Uh, yes, that does help clarify. I, in the time we had, we didn't get into that level of detail. I think a lot of the initial conversations were around engagement. That being said, I think that's where we'll start to move towards. So as you mentioned, it might be a little bit longer for us to return with that presentation, but I think we'll start to move in that direction. And I also know we don't have a set timeline yet, but hopefully in the next, probably starting next fall, but maybe a little, and then over the next two years, the sustainability plan and vision Longmont uh, will begin their update. So we'll also be looking into how we can set up this growing water smart effort to kind of 
maybe more strongly integrate into those plans. So I, I think later in the year, we should have some more information that we can return and present to the board on. That sounds great. No rush. I just think it'd be something that would be important for us to pay attention to. And like you say, then we could maybe integrate it into the sustainability um, goals that the city has, you know, long-term, just make sure we're tracking with the water supply planning. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. Any other questions, comments for uh, Francie here? Scott, you have one? Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, it's not for Francie. I apologize for any inconvenience, but I had a 4.30 appointment scheduled upon me, so I'm going to have to excuse myself and check back with you all next month. Sounds good. Well, Merry Christmas, Scott. Merry we'll Christmas, everybody. Year. Happy holidays. Thank you. Good on. See ya. Okay, with that... Um, we're through the items from staff. We're onto the items from board. Um, item 10A is a review of major project listings and items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. The only one I really saw on there for January is once again to discuss the water legislation in more detail. Is there anything else, Ken, that you see coming up that we need to, to um, be thinking about? Um, nothing that we really haven't already been discussing. All right, with that, we're on to informational items and water board correspondence. Um, is there anything that the board wants to bring up um, at this point for the uh, consideration or discussion? And I'm not seeing anything. Um, so with that, we're on to items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. Once again, the legislative update, and then in March, we'll revisit the cash and lieu. Um, and I think that that is it. Um, is there anything anybody else wants to add for the, the last board meeting of the year here? I don't see anything. So with that, I just, um, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting and wish everybody a, a Merry Christmas and look forward to, uh, 2021. Hopefully we can see everybody in person and get back to more of a, <laughs> a normal meeting. Yes. So it'd be good to meet Allison and the other board meet, uh, members in, in person beyond Zoom. Yeah. So I look just, forward to that. Just one item of note, our next meeting will be January the 25th. So we're going to delay it one week um, due to the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday in January. So we'll see you on January 25th, y'all. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, Happy holidays everybody. everybody. Happy holidays, everybody. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.